Before we get going with episode 71, a word from our friends at Monmouth Park. With full fields and big payouts, Monmouth Park has returned as a place to profit. Monmouth's Friday Night Twilight cards are the perfect place to build that weekend bankroll. Live action from Monmouth Park starts at 5 p.m. Eastern every Friday. Weekend action at Monmouth Park begins at 12.15 Eastern every Saturday and Sunday, kicking off the 50-cent win early pick five. Start your weekend days with a bang by playing the 15% takeout win early pick five every Saturday and Sunday. It's one of the nation's first pick fives every weekend. It's big fields, competitive racing, and big paydays. All at beautiful Monmouth Park Racetrack. Now, on to episode 71. What's happening? Welcome into the Matt Bernier Show, part of the In The Money Media Network. My name is Matt Bernier. You can follow me on Twitter at Bernier underscore Matt. Today is Monday, June the 21st, 2021. This is episode 71 of the show. However you listen, thank you for doing so. Many ways to find the podcast. For those of you who listen just to the audio version, you have Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, InTheMoneyPodcast.com, just to name a few. And if you are someone who watches along over on YouTube, search bar, Matt Bernier Show, you'll get this episode along with the 70 prior as is the case with any avenue that you find this thing, please rate, review, subscribe. Uh, make sure if you're over on YouTube, the bell icon is lit up so you get notified anytime new content is uploaded to the In The Money Media channel. Uh, and as always, we, we appreciate all sorts of feedback, both positive and negative, because it helps kind of cater to what the audience, all of you listening and watching, are really looking for. Uh, for this week's show, a little bit light, knowing that we've got a pretty good weekend coming up ahead of us, especially down at Churchill Downs. You've got the Stephen Foster on deck. You've got the Fleur de Lis. I think it should be a nice a nice afternoon of racing. I really do, and, and I'm looking forward to it. I believe we're supposed to be having a, a bit of an ABR show, a live stream, so uh, I'll be tweeting that out later on in the week, I'm sure, no question about it, but uh, come aboard and enjoy the races with us. Sounds like we're going to have a, a relatively short field anyway, at least from what I've seen, for the Foster. But we're going to have quality in there, specifically with Max Field. We'll find out if he can continue on his path to being one of the better older horses here in training in the United States. And then we will pivot to this week's Friday feature, which has a new wrinkle. Jeff O'Reilly is the guest. He's a returning guest. He's been on in the past. The way the Friday feature is going to work going forward, if you not only correctly identify the winner of the Friday feature... And you, if there are multiples, you are drawn out of it and you're the one who gets to come aboard next week and chop things up. Uh, I'm not giving you the race anymore. You are going to give me the race that you want to discuss for the Friday feature itself. Now, the criteria for what I'm looking for for a decent kind of contest race, something that has a relatively large field, doesn't have to be massive, but more than five horses, something that looks pretty competitive, Perhaps even one that may have a vulnerable favorite where perhaps you can shop around and make cases for some of the bigger prices in there as well. Um, and one that, you know, if you're going to pick a turf race, um, ideally it would be a, a race where we're not going to have to worry about the weather and being washed off. So that's sort of the criteria going forward. For this week, I thought Jeff did a very good job of identifying a, a salty race that you can make a case for a few different runners in there, and you've got a favorite, or I'm going to presume a favorite, who might be a little bit vulnerable. Art Collector coming off of a lengthy layoff. He will be returning on Friday afternoon at Churchill Downs, race number 10. That is the Kelly's Landing, stakes action on a Friday. So Jeff and I talk about that race a little bit. We talk about his opinion of the three-year-olds. And there was a, I kind of piggybacked the idea of Essential Quality and Mystic Guide, uh, how they could end up being, and I totally omitted Maxfield from the conversation, but Godolphin could have a pretty potent hand as far as the Breeders' Cup Classic is concerned, and it made me think, and this will be kind of what we kick things off with here for this week's show, and please feel free to add in some other horses that I may be glossing over. Uh, I'm not doing it intentionally, it just may be horses that I've forgotten about, we, we talk so much about these three-year-olds, and you know last week we had a lot of good feedback down in the comment section beneath the video player on YouTube, which, by the way, that's where you need to submit your selection 
for the Friday feature. And if you've already done that, please send me an email bernier.matt89 at gmail.com. At least that way I will have an email address where I can reach out to you uh, in the event that you do select the winner in that race. But back to what we're talking about. Going through and how they could have a really good Godolphin, have a good hand. And we've already talked about the three-year-olds and we had a lot of good feedback last week's show about what people thought of them. Are they good, bad, indifferent? What do we think they could turn into? Well, I started thinking about it and this year's older group you know, I'm having a hard time, just off the top of my head anyway, putting it together on what it could look like. So, sure, we know the three-year-olds who could potentially be running in a race like the Breeders' Cup Classic. Who are the older faces that we should get familiar with, uh, knowing that we are coming up into that sort of, let's call it the, the classic division's bread and butter, where you've got races like the Foster coming up this weekend. In a couple weeks, you'll have uh, the Suburban at Belmont Park. We'll talk about some of those horses as well. Before you know it, we're going to have races like the Whitney at Saratoga and the Pacific Classic out at Del Mar and the Jockey Club Gold Cup now at Saratoga, not at Belmont Park anymore. So some of these names... Oh, and there was news that came out earlier today that country grammar, for the time being anyway, has been transferred from Bob Baffert's barn to Todd Pletcher's barn with the goal or the intent of a summer campaign at Saratoga and perhaps even starting as soon as the Suburban at Belmont Park in two weeks' time. So it made me think, and the reason obviously being that Baffert is currently unable or not allowed to run horses in New York. So Country Grammar moves over to Todd Pletcher's barn. So I put together a little list, good catch there, uh, of horses that I, off the top of my head are the ones that seem like potential runners for races like the Breeders' Cup Classic, and maybe we'll see some develop and kind of, you know, kind of come out of nowhere over the next two to three or even four months as we get right to the Breeders' Cup that could throw their hat in the ring. But these are horses who have done some good things in the past. They've run fast races, cases to be made, cases to be made against some of them uh, to go along with the three-year-olds. So Mystic Guide, I think, is the one you have to just immediately go right to winner of the Dubai World Cup. He's looked so impressive as a four-year-old. It feels like he's that kind of horse that he needed that time. Last year, wasn't quite ready as a three-year-old. Ran good races, but wasn't quite ready to take that next step. Well, here we are. We're seeing what he can do. He's flourishing. Sounds like we'll see him in two weeks at Belmont, along with Happy Saver, another Pletcher runner who has defeated Mystic Guide on the square in last year's Jockey Club Gold Cup. He came back as a winner in his seasonal debut, and those two alone in New York would make for a, a pretty a pretty salty run through the Saratoga season and into the fall. Add Country Grammar to that, the winner of the Hollywood Gold Cup most recently when he went out there and dueled for the second consecutive race with Royal Ship, who well, basically I want to tie them together because I all along figured the two of them would run it back in the Pacific Classic, but now it sounds like Country Grammar is going to go to New York. Well, he is in New York. Perhaps that means the path to Pacific Classic victory is a little bit easier for Royal Ship. Yes, he may have to deal with a horse like Hot Rod Charlie, the three-year-old for Doug O'Neill, but as far as the older horses are concerned in Southern California on dirt, Royal Ship and Country Grammar, they were far and away the fastest. Well, now if Country Grammar's gone, the, the door is open for a horse like Royal Ship to really take control of that division out there. All four of those horses, they've run fast races. Mile and a quarter is not a problem for any one of them. And I think those four alone would make for a really nice group of older horses, knock on wood, should they all get there, and point toward a race like the Breeders' Cup Classic. But then there are more horses that we can add to this thing. You know, I brought up how Country Grammar and Royal Ship, far and away the fastest in Southern California, that's no disrespect to Express Train. But... I think calling a spade a spade, right now he looks slower than those two. But he's a consistent 100 kind of buyer horse. Mile and a quarter is not a problem for him. I would assume he's going to be a horse targeting a race like the P-Classic. I don't want to totally overlook a horse like Idol for Richard Baltus, who I believe is still out of training, but don't quote me on that. He may be back into light training with the goal of some sort of a, a summer or fall campaign. Throw him back into the mix he becomes mildly intriguing. I'm not the biggest fan of Idol, or I haven't been to date. Maybe my opinion will change in time. I look at he and Express Train relatively similarly, that they're good horses, but they're probably a notch below 
the the mystic guides and the country grammars and the royal ships and the happy savers. But they definitely fit in this category. I look at them probably in the same vein as a by my standards, who I'll throw his name into the to the hat into the mix anyway, in that. They're very talented race horses. They're probably grade one slash two types. Whereas I feel like the top four are legitimate grade one caliber runners on dirt, at least from what we've seen here this year in 2021. Nick's go. I don't know what you want to do with him. We talked about him last week. I brought him up on the Horse Player Happy Hour this past week with Peter Thomas Fornatal and said, I would like to think he'd get one more shot in a race like the Whitney. Take a chance to try to just go out there Bottom the field out, and if it works, you have earned your right, or I don't want to say you're right, but I mean, at least you're back on track toward thinking about something like the Breeders' Cup Classic as opposed to the Dirt Mile. And if it doesn't work, all right, so be it. Now we kind of regroup. But until then, knowing the whole two-turn narrative and all that kind of stuff and that wicked speed he does possess, I'll keep Nick's go in the mix here. So you add him to the group that I've just laid out. Now, there are two other names that I haven't mentioned yet. One of them is a horse that I, I, I'm i still not totally convinced that I think he is a grade one mile and an eighth to mile and a quarter type. But Silver State at least deserves to have his name in there, given what he's done down at Oaklawn Park and now winner of the Met Mile most recently. You know... I think he, until proven otherwise, he deserves to be included in this group. In my heart of hearts, I'm I'm still not totally convinced. But that doesn't mean that he can't prove me wrong. It's happened many times. It'll happen many times again. But Silver State, throw him into the mix now. We brought up Maxfield at the top, and I I don't want to say I just kind of glossed over him. But I feel like of the three Godolphin charges, if we're including essential quality with Mystic Guide, to me at a mile and a quarter, Maxfield might be just that notch below. Now we'll find out on Saturday at a mile and an eighth how he shapes up. He looked fantastic winning the Ali Sheba in his most recent start. That was on Derby weekend. And he's a really good horse. But I I guess I have that sanity to handicap still in the back of my mind that I didn't think the trip was really all that bad. And he just, he, he found a couple better. Well, Maybe we won't find out this weekend. I'm more concerned about the distance than necessarily how how talented he is. I think he's probably among the better horses at a mile and a 16th or a mile and an eighth. Get out to that 10 furlongs. That's when I start to get a little bit worried. But And we won't find that answer, or I won't get any kind of clarity on that answer this weekend. But I at least want to see him continuing on that path of running big races. And you would think if he runs big here, maybe it's, you know... Trying to jockey the different positions where these horses run. If Mystic Guide, let's assume he goes to the Whitney, you know, does Maxfield sit out and wait for the 10 for a long Jockey Club Gold Cup? Or do they send him out west to run in the Pacific Classic? There are so many different ways that the thing could shake down. Um, and the last horse I'll mention, although reports were that he was unlikely to come over here, and I have not seen anything on this horse in a long, long time, uh, Mishriff, who won the... Uh, the Saudi Cup this year. The one-turn mile in an eighth race. He defeated Charlatan. Uh, He took advantage of the pace scenario, but he ran a very, very fast race. He's also a grade one winner on turf. Uh, John Gosden, months and months ago, was on record saying it was unlikely that he would run in a race like the Breeders' Cup Classic because of the way Del Mar's main track is and having spent time out there and trained out in Southern California. He feels like this this horse is not necessarily a fit. We'll find out if that's how it all plays out. We have seen connections change their minds at different points. Um, And again, to be honest, I don't even know the latest news on Mishriff. If he's in training, what races they're targeting. I know the long-term goal uh, was the ARC, and rightfully so. But aside from that, I, I haven't seen a great deal. So who knows? But to me, even if you take Mishriff out of it, that's the group of older horses that sort of were the ones that I I could think of off the top of my head. If I've missed anyone, a glaring omission, let me know in the comment section beneath the video player or on Twitter at Bernie or underscore Matt. You take these horses, you add them to 
a group of three-year-olds who, at the very least, are solid, at best, are, are pretty good, pretty strong, um, I think it's a, it's a compelling group anyway for a race like a Breeders' Cup Classic, assuming they all get there. I know we have a long way to go. We haven't even got to July 4th yet. But I think over the next few weeks, we're really going to start to see this division take a little bit more shape than it has thus far. I feel like it's still kind of an amoeba. Is that the right word? I, I, I was not good in biology. And, you know, the, the I was thinking of, I can see like the slide of underneath the microscope. You get my, my point is it, it, it's kind of jelly. It's kind of moving around right now. I'd like to think it's going to start to solidify a little bit over the next few weeks and as we go on through the summer, not just keeping an eye on the three-year-olds. I don't want them to take all of the attention. Keep an eye on this sort of division because these are the horses we'll be talking about about you know four and a half months from now down at Del Mar for the Breeders' Cup Classic. Let me know if you what your thoughts are with these horses I've rattled off or if I've missed anyone. Again, Beneath the Video Player on YouTube or on Twitter at Bernie or underscore Matt. Speaking of Beneath the Video Player on YouTube, that's where your official selections need to go for the Friday feature. I would also appreciate it if you email me ahead of time, bernier.matt89 at gmail.com. That way, at least I have an easier way to get in contact with you if you are either the winner or if no one picks a winner, I can just go through and find someone who has already dropped me a line and I can reach out to them and find out if they want to be in Jeff O'Reilly's shoes next week. Jeff O'Reilly was the guest for this week's Friday feature. And again, it is race number 10 at Churchill Downs the Kelly's Landing, the return of Art Collector. Jeff and I talk about that race as well as his opinions on the three-year-olds and a few other divisions as well. So let's get to this week's Friday feature with Jeff O'Reilly. All right, Friday feature time. We're finally getting back at it with a guest. He is a returning guest. We've had him on before, Jeff O'Reilly. Jeff, congratulations on picking the winner. You and a few other folks did this past week at Belmont Park and uh, you won the random draw. So Congrats. Welcome back. How's everything? Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me on. Um, it's going great. You know, it'd be a little bit better if the if my Sixers didn't choke last night, but oh. we move on. So so where do you stand now? I was just going back. I was watching hockey late last night, and I, I just missed all of the, the basketball stuff yesterday. And, I mean, is Ben Simmons, is it a point now where there's no return? Do you have to move on from him, or is it one of those things you think, there's some sort of a reclamation project because it's not as though he can't play at all. We know that, but something certainly seems like it's off a little bit mentally as far as the game goes. At this point, I don't see how you don't move on. I mean, unfortunately, you know, his trade value is probably about as low as it's ever been. But I mean, if you even listen to a beat after the game and doc after the game, it sounds like they're, they're like already ready to move on. So I don't see how you bring him back. I mean, it's, I mean, it's a shame because he, he obviously has talent. I don't know if it's just a mental thing. I guess it has to be that he just, I mean, that, I don't know if you saw the, the one light where he basically had yeah. a light and passed it up to Matisse. Like, how does that happen? I mean, just that play alone is just enough for me to say we got to move on. I mean, obviously something has to change. I don't think you can just run it back again. If we're just going to keep you know losing in the second round, I think something has to change. And he's the obvious, obvious catalyst to, you know, move on because he probably, I don't know, probably has the most trade value, but then again, like I said, it's at its lowest point. So it's kind of like a hit or miss thing, but yeah, you have to move on from him in my opinion. That's kind of how I feel about the Bruins in the NHL. I mean, you keep running it back and they have success, but they clearly at this point, they're a team that's not good enough to really hang with the big boys. So you got to do something different. And I'm a little bit fearful. It sounds like they may just try to run it back one more time, which I feel like we've been saying that for the past four years, run it back after they lost to the blues in the cup finals, it just feels like something's had to change and it hasn't. So um, we're both in a little bit of a precarious position there as far as our uh, couple of our teams are concerned. Uh, before we get into the Friday feature and we have the new sort of wrinkle now when we've brought it back that the guest is actually the one who's going to determine what the Friday race that we go over is. And luckily for us this week, we've got some stakes action. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, I'm just curious your thoughts about the three-year-old picture uh, as a whole, as we get closer and closer, the Haskell's only a few weeks away at Monmouth Park. That to me is sort of the, I don't want to say the de facto kickoff for the three-year-olds in the summer, but from a grade one standpoint, there are only a few options. You have that race. And then clearly the Travers at the end of the Saratoga meeting um, with what we've seen, for the Triple Crown so far, or not even just the Triple Crown, I guess you can go even farther back than that. 
not including all of the Baffert stuff, just strictly from what we've seen on the racetrack, what's your sort of opinion? What are your feelings about the three-year-olds to date? Um, it's, t- it's tough to tell the overall quality. I mean, I think essential quality is obviously a very, very good racehorse and hopefully down the road, you know, in the Breeders' Cup Classic, he can kind of see, you know, how good he is, but I think it's a pretty good crop. I mean, like Hot Rod Charlie ran his absolute eyeballs out in the Belmont Stakes, you know, came up short, but I think Mandaloon's a very good horse. I mean, I think there's certainly a lot of quality. And then, I mean, the the, sprint, the three-year-old sprinters are actually very, there's a ton of quality there too. But as far as like the, you know, classical races, I mean, essential quality looks like he could be, you know, he's just like a classic grinding type horse. And I mean, a mile and a quarter, mile and a half just fits him perfectly. So I think he's a very good horse. And I, I still really like Mandaloon. I mean, his running style is just perfect for pretty much any race. Obviously, I'm still sick of Belt. <laughs> I, did, I did have a bet on him. I would have had a nice little try too, but we move on. But I mean, I still think those two are probably the, the top class and hot rod Charlie may be in third, but I mean, I think the top of the three-year-old division, I think it's pretty solid. I think it could be really interesting too, if things kind of continue to progress like this, it sounds like in a few weeks at Belmont for the suburban, we'll end up seeing mystic guide come back, make it his first start from over in Dubai and, and assuming he stays healthy and essential quality stays healthy, Godolphin could have a, a pretty potent one, two punch as far as the breeders cup classic is concerned. And I, I'm glad you brought up the sprinters because Jackie's warrior is the horse who I probably still haven't given him the, the due that he deserves because the past two runs, the Pat day mile, I, I was on record saying, look, I thought it was, they ran really fast early on. The final time wasn't off the charts fast, but it's how they got to that point to earn that final time, both he and Dream Shake. But I, I was I was a little bit unsure of what to think of it, simply because no one was doing any running from the back for the most part. And with a pace like that, you would think going a one-turn mile, somebody would be doing something from the back. So it made me wonder if maybe it was a little bit of an optical illusion. No, Dream Shake didn't run particularly well at Belmont uh, on Belmont Stakes Day, but I, he was down toward the inside for the majority of that run at the time when I didn't think he really wanted to be there. And Jackie's Warrior came back with just another bang up effort and just got nipped by drain the clock. So between those three that we just mentioned, and that's not including any of these other horses, especially and his name is slipping my mind, the horse out on the West Coast for John Sadler, who debuted and and ran off the screen that 105 buyer, I think they're going to keep him out on the West Coast, I could be wrong. But um, that looks like a really strong group of horses for a division that I think, at least for me, and, and feel free to chime in. After the the Churchill Downs, the grade one, I just, I don't know. And I guess if you want to include the Met Mile, which is, you know, I suppose an elongated sprint. It just seems a little lacking, a little lackluster, and perhaps it's a prime opportunity for some of these three-year-olds to really jump up. Yeah, uh, the the Churchill Downs, that was the, like, the seven-horse blanket finish, if I remember. Yes, I mean, anytime you see a race like that, sure, it it was a grade one, but anytime you see a blanket finish like that, you always have to question pretty much like the quality of the field. So I agree with you. I think the three-year-olds are probably in a good position, you know, as far as later in the year. And I'm, I'm with you. I've tried to beat Jackie's Warrior the last two times out. I'll probably do it again. <laughs> For whatever reason, the horse, there's just something about the horse. Like, and obviously it runs well pretty much every time. Like even, you know, the Breeders' Cup last year, the Juvenile, it got beat up in a wicked pace. It still ran on okay. Like it just yeah. runs hard every time. There's just something about the horse. I keep trying to beat. Maybe I'm just stubborn, but – I mean, he's a really good, really good sprinter. Maybe I'll give him his credit next when we see him next, but I don't know. I'll probably try and beat him again. I'm still holding out for, uh, and I haven't read anything. I assume he's still in training and everything is okay. I'm still holding out for the highly motivated turn back, whether it is in the, in the H Allen Jerkins or something like that, because I do think he's that kind of horse that with the setup that we saw in some of those other races, whether it was the Woody Stevens or the Pat Day Mile, I feel like he's that kind of horse that could take advantage and, you know, I sound like a broken record, but I keep going back to practical joke. He feels like another version of practical joke to me. So we'll see what happens. The good news is it sounds like everyone's OK. Everybody's in good health. Maybe we get to see these divisions hopefully stay as relatively sound and, and put together as as they can be going throughout the rest of the summer and into the early fall. Let's talk about this race here, the Friday feature again. Whoever the guest is now. Ball is in your court. I'm going to just kind of tee you up and say, find a race that you like, that you think is going to be competitive. There are some angles that we can go with. Hopefully the weather doesn't kind of deteriorate any of these things too, too badly. 
And I understand that's, you know, hit or miss. You never know what's going to happen, especially this time of year in the summer in some of these places where thunderstorm pops up, rolls through, drops a ton of rain, and that's that. But this race that you've chosen, Jeff, race number 10 on Friday at Churchill Downs, it is the Kelly's Landing. Stakes action on a Friday. Fantastic. Seven-eighths of a mile on the main track. And not only is it stakes action, but I think it's a pretty quality group of horses, especially for a Friday, headlined by the return of Art Collector for Tom Drury. And, you know, that was kind of what you had sent me in the message, you know, weighing a couple of races. This one won out with the return of Art Collector. I guess before we dive into the race, you know, soup to nuts, what did you think of Art Collector last year as a three-year-old? And given the way he finished his three-year-old campaign, which I think is safe to say lackluster at best, what do you do with him in a race like this, coming back, knowing he's going to take money? Do you look at it and say, you know what, I still believe in him? Or is this a prime opportunity to maybe take advantage of an instance where you're going to get overlaid odds on the other horses? Yeah, I mean, I was I was a fan of our collector. You know, it was a shame after that Ellis Park Derby that he, I'm not really, I'm, I'm not really sure of the full story, but, you know, he obviously had to miss the Derby and then comes back in the Preakness. It seems like they kind of almost forced that race into him. And then he just runs a complete dud in the Breeders' Cup mile, dirt mile. So, you know, they're cutting him all the way back to seven. This feels like a prep for probably something bigger down the road. I'm not really sure they're too keen on winning this race. I, I don't think seven furlongs is nearly his best distance. So I'm definitely willing and definitely will be taking a shot against him in here. Uh, but as you mentioned, I think this field is, feels very, very evenly matched. I think you can go a lot of different ways. And I'm really excited to see how this thing unfolds. You know, from a pace standpoint, when I was just kind of going through glossing it over, you, you look at strike power. I feel like he has one way to go. He's got to go to the front. That's the name of his game. He's always been a horse that I've had a hard time really warming up to. I thought he was really interesting early on as a three-year-old because he was so darn fast. But mechanically, he always does things a little bit funny, and I'm not convinced he really wants to pass anyone. So unless he's controlling speed, which he may very well be in this race, but it's not as though you've got other horses that are just totally void of early foot. Home base is a horse who I think is going to be relatively close to the front end. Uh, Bango in the past has shown the ability to be forward, but I like that in the Aristides, he rallied from off of it as well. How'd you see the pace scenario unfolding? Yeah, uh, I viewed it pretty much the same as you. Uh, I, I would assume strike powers on the lead, but I mean, I mean, if you just look at his PPs, he's really only, he hasn't been in seven furlong race in quite some time. The pedigree is obviously fine for seven furlongs, but you know, sometimes pedigree only matters until it doesn't. So, I mean, that extra furlong could certainly trip him up. Um, I'm assuming Ricardo's just going to send, try and just wire the field. I mean, that last race at the Maryland sprint, there was no closing going on. You know, I just watched the replay, you know, prepping for this. There wasn't, I mean, that whole day at Pimlico, there really wasn't much closing going on the main track. So they went one, two around the track. I'm not really surprised by that. Uh, but I agree with you. I think, you know, home base is certainly going to go. And I mean, I mean, Bango has a lot of speed. Like if you look at his races, two back, it was a 21 and four opening quarter. He was a neck behind, you know, very good sprinters in there. So, you know, if he breaks, it almost seems like he's determined it's based on how he breaks. So if he breaks, well, he's, he's going to go. Um, he obviously has different ways to win a race. You know, like you mentioned last time, he, he closed into the pace. But, you know, if he breaks well, like he'll, he'll certainly press the pace. So I don't see strike power, good, but, you know, on paper, it really doesn't set up perfectly for somebody to just wire this field. Some of the other horses in here were very highly fancied early on as two-year-olds, three-year-olds. And not to say they didn't train on, but they just never really got any better. And I always use that analogy of the you know, the little leaguer who, you know, is, is six feet tall and he throws 70 miles an hour. And the problem is at the time, yeah, he looks like a superstar, but when everybody else grows up and he doesn't get any better, the field catches up to him and then goes by him. I feel like that's what's been basically the case for a horse like Mucho down on the inside or even long range toddy, the four horse in here for Dallas Stewart. Now, um, both of these horses, I think are probably a little bit better coming from off of the pace. So they would probably appreciate something really hot to run into. I'm curious your thoughts, especially on Mucho, a horse that I just, I go through his overall body of work and I go seven, eight's really what he wants to do. Yeah, um, I completely agree. I mean, he kind of does seem a little bit slow on figures. If you just look at it, like his top end ceiling is pretty much like the bottom of the you know, quote unquote top contenders of, you know, an art collector or strike power. So I mean, it seems like he's going to need 
pretty good setup here. Like he'll need, you know, the three speeds to knock at it. And then he'll need pretty much our collector to not show up. You'll probably get a decent price on them. So I'm not going to really talk anyone out of them. But for me, I just didn't really see too much of a path to victory for that horse. And uh, long range toddy, I've just never been a fan of long range toddy. They've tried a, a bunch of different things with them. You know, last race, they cut them all the way back to six. Ran pretty well, but I mean, that pace was blazing and the race kind of fell apart late. And I, I've just never really been a fan of the horse. So that, that'll be just another one. You know, if he wins, I pretty much lose. The horses we haven't really touched on just yet. I'm sure I'm going to assume your selection is probably coming from one of them. Uh, Bourbon Calling is an interesting one in here for Ian Wilkes. Haven't seen him since the end of November last year when they tried the grade one Clark going two turns. Uh, Aloha West is the lightly raced runner in here who looks like he could be anything for Wayne Catalano on the heels of a blowout victory, breaking through the N1X condition. And then R Relentless Dancer for Mike Maker is a, a really intriguing piece in here simply because they lost him for 32 two starts back this entire outfit maker same ownership group and then they dip back in to take him for 62 five and wheel him back here in just a few weeks into a stakes race um fair to say your selection's coming from one of these three uh you nailed it yes <laughs> um i my, my top pick is aloha west i mean that this horse looks like it could it could be any kind um i wasn't really too thrilled with you know many of the other runners the only, the only problem is you know it's going to be coming from you know, a little far back, the Churchill down surface doesn't always play kind of, you know, deep closers. So that gives me a little bit of pause, but, you know, you get flow. And I mean, the horse just, it just runs pretty much every time out. You know, it's only bad, you know, bad after three back at Oakland. I guess you can make an excuse, you know, didn't have the cleanest of breaks. And, but I mean, that, that horse, you know, it's coming in off of bullet work last out. It seems like it's going to get a ton of pace to run at. I'm assuming the price should be, you know, almost, should, I'm assuming it should be close to 10 to one, you know, just all the other horses in here that are going to take money. So I just really like the trip that this one's going to get. And I think seven furlong should hit this one right between the eyes. And I'm really hoping for a big run in the stretch. You get a big bullet in the back pocket, 47 flat on June the 16th. You would like to think as a four-year-old, they're trying a stakes race here. If he gets through this, or even if he doesn't win, but let's say he runs very well, you would assume the connections have got to be thinking bigger and better down the road. Maybe a race like the four go at the end of the Saratoga meeting going seven eighths of a mile, especially for the reasons we were just talking about that, that older sprint division seems a little, little suspect, a little ripe for the picking. So Aloha West, I think is a really intriguing runner in here, a horse who we may know what everyone else can do. I, I, I tend to agree with you that we probably haven't seen the best from Aloha West just yet. We'll find out if we do on Friday afternoon, and of the other two that we mentioned, just briefly, Bourbon Calling as well as Relentless Dancer, any opinions on either of them? The, the layoff is intriguing, maybe not in a good way for Bourbon Calling. I mean, he's been gone for quite some time, but it's not as though the horses never run well at seven-eighths of a mile, despite the fact that they've tried to stretch him out in distance in the past. Uh, and then the reasons I, I brought up about the maker reclaim, um, confident move, no question about it, but on, on figs, I'm, I'm not quite sure he stacks up, but look, I, I'm certainly not going to doubt Mike Maker. He knows what he's doing here. Any thoughts on either of those two? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll start with Relentless Dancer. I mean, you mentioned it. Anytime, you know, a trainer on the on the reclaim, especially especially a Mike Maker reclaim, like you, know, like you said, they, they lost the horse for 32, and then, you know, one race later, they claim the horse for, you know, 62. Like, that's going to get your attention. I mean, the horse can win, certainly, I guess. But, I mean, it, for me, it's just, too slow on figs. Like, I just don't see, you know, a, a reasonable path for this one to win. I mean, last out, you know, tried to wire, you know, a much lesser field. It spit it out pretty good. You know, two back four maker, it, you know, it pretty much just got a perfect trip going, you know, 23 and 46 against, you know, claiming 32 thousands. Yeah. It's ran some stakes races, you know, um, in the summer of last year, but again, it looks more like a plotting type. I'm not sure it's stakes quality. And that this field is pretty much, kind of like a almost a grade three type like a lesser grade three i mean it's a pretty good field for sure i'm just not sure that this this horse you know stacks up against the others and as for, but i actually thought bourbon calling was a little bit interesting here um it's races at seven furlongs have been pretty good you know it's got some some back figs that that fit here um ian wilkes i'm not really sure is too known for getting horses ready you know first off the bench but 
I mean, I think the horse fits. Um, it'll be closing. Again, I'm not too keen on betting too many deep closers at Churchill, but there's a lot of speed in here. I think this one can get a right trip. I'm not sure it can win, but certainly can, you know, fill out an exotic, like an exact or a try at a, at a pretty big price, I'm assuming. That was kind of my thought. Bourbon Calling is a, uh, a sneaky. I've always kind of liked him, and, and I feel like there is something there. I, I, I don't know that I love that they've tried to stretch him out in the past. And, and granted, they haven't done it frequently, but they have tried to get him out through a route of ground. And he's run just well enough, I think, just to kind of tease everybody to think maybe there is something more there. Maybe there isn't, but he is another one off of such a lengthy layoff. You're going to need that pace scenario that we talked about to really heat up for him to come running. But to your point, Jeff, I think he is a prime candidate to perhaps hit the board at, at maybe an overlaid price. Maybe he is at least a double digit type that can kind of spice some things up, but on the record, Jeff for the Friday feature race number 10, the Kelly's landing seven eighths of a mile down at Churchill downs on Friday afternoon. You're going to go with the number seven Aloha West for Wayne Catalano and for Florent Giroux be really interesting to see what we get from this one for all the reasons that Jeff mentioned. And who knows, maybe this is the beginning of bigger and better for this lightly raced four-year-old son of hard spun. Jeff, uh, I appreciate you coming back on. You're the re first, let's say, reboot guest of the Friday feature now that we're back into the swing of things and the Triple Crown has kind of been put aside for a little bit. So I thank you for coming on. Uh, good luck this weekend with this race and uh, we'll chat again soon. All right, sounds good. Thanks for having me on, Matt. You got it. Thanks again to Jeff for identifying the Kelly's Landing as a really intriguing race, and I'll be fascinated to see how the whole thing plays out. Be very interested to see who you all like in the race. Again, beneath the video player on YouTube, that's where you need to make your official selection for this week's Friday feature, the 10th at Churchill Downs. Questions, comments, concerns, as always, beneath the video player on YouTube uh, or on Twitter, at Bernie or underscore Matt. Uh, please rate, review, and subscribe if you're over on sort of the just the audio version over on wherever if you listen to it just audio wise apple podcast spotify soundcloud in the money podcast.com all of those areas if you're over on youtube matt bernie your show in the search bar you get this episode along with the 70 prior prior please rate review and subscribe i will be back next monday with episode 72 but until then this has been episode 71 of the matt bernie show best of luck however you play whatever you play where